Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shafiq, and I'm from Patient Liaison Service Department, Singapore General Hospital. I will be your MC this morning. Thank you for tuning in, and welcome back to day two of 200 minutes of ENT Health, organized by the Department of Otorhinolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery. The theme for today will be nose and throat infections. So if, if you have any burning questions for our speakers, do submit them by clicking on the Zoom Q&A button that you see on your screen. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Sean Lowe with the welcome address and introduction. Dr. Lowe, over to you. Hi, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us today for this event. I hope you're all relaxed at home, uh, having your breakfast while you tune in to us. I hope you can learn something from us today. So um, just a brief introduction um, of our department. So although today's focus is mainly on sleep, sleep apnea and uh, its related ENT conditions, uh, our department actually, we have consultants that subspecialize in the whole array of ENT conditions. Uh, we are the largest uh, ENT department in Singapore. So we have consultants that look into sleep issues, into nose issues, into hearing issues, uh, as well as you know, into voice and head and neck cancers. So, you know, if, if you, fi you find that you, you need some of your ENT uh, conditions, uh, uh, I mean, some, you have queries that you need un answered or you have conditions that need to be evaluated, just feel free to come visit us over here at SGH. So, um, without further ado, uh, let me just have a brief, give you a brief introduction of today's um, webinar. So, today's focus is mainly on sleep. Uh, we're going to talk about sleep apnea and how it affects the quality of sleep. And we're going to talk about how sleep apnea uh, affects uh, other things like the nose and throat and vice versa. So uh, in the first talk uh, given by myself, I'll be giving a brief overview of obstructive sleep apnea and uh, what, what the condition is about and its implications. And subsequently, my colleagues will be talking about how the nose relates to sleep apnea and how sleep apnea can affect the throat as well. So uh, yep, without further ado, let's just move on to the first talk. Yep, uh, Shafiq, please. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining me for this talk on snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. A brief overview of today's talk. First, I'll talk about what OSA is, why I think it's relevant, how we can recognize OSA, and tell you about some of the treatments available right now. So before I talk about OSA, maybe I should talk about what happens every night as we sleep. As we fall asleep every night, we enter stage one sleep, and then as we go deeper into sleep, we go into stage two, stage three, and then REM sleep. REM sleep is a stage of sleep where dreams occur. So every night we go through all these stages several times. Each cycle lasts typically between about 90 to 120 minutes. Stage 1 and stage 2 sleep are considered light sleep, whereas stage 3 and REM sleep are considered deep sleep. So for one to feel refreshed the next day, one needs to have adequate amounts of stage 3 and REM sleep. If for some reason the sleep is disrupted and you hover in stage 1 and stage 2 sleep, then even if you have sufficient quantity of sleep, because the quality is compromised, you wake up tired the next day. So what exactly is OSA? Simply put, it is repeated episodes of collapse of the upper airway at night that results in obstruction of breathing during sleep. So if you look at a normal patient, you know, the upper airway from the nose and mouth to the voice box is unobstructed and airflow is smooth. In sleep apnea patients, the upper airway gets blocked up multiple times at night. And this results in breathing disruptions that are associated with drops in blood oxygen levels that cause arousals from sleep. So these arousals from sleep are actually commonly not full arousals, meaning to say that the patients are not aware of this blockage and they don't wake up. Rather, these are micro arousals whereby patients transition from deeper sleep into lighter sleep. And as you remember in my earlier slide, if you end up with a larger proportion of light sleep, you end up waking up feeling more tired. So why is it relevant? Well, I think OSA is relevant because it is very common. With more recent studies showing that up to 17 to 50% of adults worldwide have OSA. In Singapore, it has been shown that the prevalence of moderate to severe OSA is about 30%. So, you know, if you think about it, one third of the people in attendance today could very well have OSA. And I think what is more important is that this study showed that a large proportion of the patients were actually not aware that they had this problem. And why is it important that we know, why is it important to diagnose OSA? Because OSA is related to increased cardiovascular risk. And this has been shown by many studies 
Just take, for example, this study that looked at 1,651 men. They showed that men with OSA had a 3.5 times increased risk of dying from a heart attack. If you look at non-fatal cardiac events, the risk was about 4.7 times more. And how this happens is that OSA, like I mentioned earlier, causes upper airway, in upper, the upper airway blockages causes intermittent drops in the blood oxygen levels and recurring arouses from sleep. Taken together, this results in activation of the sympathetic system or the fight or flight system that results in high blood pressure at night and increased damage to blood vessel lining. The drops in oxygen level also causes stress and inflammation that directly damages the blood vessels. Sleep apnea and the link to high blood pressure is also very well known. Many large cohort studies that look at a group of patients over a long period of time have shown that patients with OSA have a 1.4 to 3 times increased risk of high blood pressure. There have also been other studies that have shown that once these patients with OSA have their OSA treated with effectively either with CPAP or surgery, their blood pressures actually drop. OSA is also a common cause of nocturia or frequent urination at night. Of course, you know, if you are in the audience today and you are experiencing nocturia, I would suggest that the first port of call or rather the first doctor you consult will be your urologist. But sometimes, you know, when the urologist evaluate the, your urinary tract and find that they can't find a cause for your symptoms of frequent urination at night, they may then refer you on to an ENT doctor to do a sleep study to see whether OSA is a contributing factor. And the reason for this is that in OSA, when there's blockage of the upper airway, one has to generate uh, more, more, more negative force to try to, to draw air in past the blockage. And this, in this, this increased negative intrathoracic pressure results in increased filling of the heart with blood, causes stretch of the heart muscle, that results in increased production of this hormone called the atrial natriuretic peptide, which then acts on the kidney to produce more urine. Studies have shown that in OSA patients, once their OSA is treated, the frequency of passing urine at night as well as the urine volume at night actually reduces. Apart from the issues I talked about earlier, OSA has also been linked to heart failure, cardiac arrhythmias or, or rather irregular heartbeats that, that occur at night, stroke and high increased eye pressure called glaucoma. So how does one recognize OSA? Let's start by looking at some of the risk factors of OSA. Age is definitely a risk factor. Common complaint from patients is that, you know, I've been snoring since I was a teenager, but only recently that my wife noticed that I choke, only recently that I start feeling tired in the day. The reason for this is that the upper airway is a muscular tube. It is lined by muscle I mean, on, on all sides. And as you get older, the elasticity of this muscle gets reduced and the collapsibility increases. So it tends to manifest later with, with age. OSA is also predominantly a male disease. And the reason for this is thought to be because of the female hormone progesterone. So progesterone, you know, in the same way that it makes your girlfriend or your wife's skin more supple than yours, it also makes their upper airway muscles more supple. And because of the increased elasticity, their airways collapse less. But this prevalence is only seen in premenopausal women. After menopause, you know, the prevalence of OSA in women actually kind of equalizes that of men after a while. Obesity is a main, contributing, main contributor to OSA because fat deposited in the neck around the jaw uh, actually compresses on the upper airway uh, at night and this results in increased blockages of the airway. In our Asian population, abnormal cranial feature, facial features such as a small jaw or receding jaw are actually main contributors. So you know, you, when you see a doctor, they will, they will assess you to see whether which is the main contributing factor? Is it the jaw size, your, your skeletal profile, or is it obesity? Smoking increases the risk of sleep apnea because it increases mucus production and increased viscosity of the mucus in your upper airway. These more viscous secretions have increased surface tension that make your airway more liable to collapse. I'll talk a bit more on alcohol, seeing that uh, today's team is happy hour, and I'm sure many of us enjoy the occasional drink or two. Alcohol has, uh, a, a, affects OSA directly because alcohol relaxes the upper airway dilator muscles. So the airway becomes more relaxed and more liable to collapse. After collapse, 
it also slows down your brain's response time and prolongs the time to awaken after the blockage occurs. So it worsens sleep apnea. Many people think that, oh, I drink some alcohol to help me sleep better. And they have that mistaken belief because of the sedating effect of alcohol. So, you know, you drink alcohol, yes, it's true that it reduces your time to fall asleep. But the problem with alcohol is that it gets metabolized and it is a short-acting sedative. So, you know, as your body metabolizes the alcohol and your blood alcohol levels drop, there will be a rebound in the later half of the night whereby there's increased stimulation and increased arousals. So what typically happens is that patients will report that they have alcohol and they fall asleep quickly and they say they, they, they sleep very fast. But what happens is that as they go through the night, as the alcohol, the blood alcohol levels drop, they wake up at about 3-4 a.m. and they find it hard to go back to sleep again. Apart from the stimulate, stimulatory effect of alcohol, alcohol also reduces the proportion of REM sleep so because there is, there's less deep sleep, the patients actually wake up feeling more unrefreshed. So what are some of the symptoms of sleep apnea that you should be looking out for? Of course, one should pay attention, one should suspect that they have OSA if there's loud snoring, especially when it's associated with choking or gasping episodes. So what your wife or bed partner may, may report to you is that they hear you snoring and then suddenly there's a period of quiet. And that pure quiet happens because you, is, there's a total obstruction and you stop breathing. And this is typically followed by a very loud snort when you suddenly gasp and resume your breathing. Patients also tend to report fragmented sleep and increased urination at night, like I mentioned earlier. Patients also tend to wake up in the morning with a morning headache because of poor sleep and oxygen deprivation at night. They wake up with a sore throat that occurs because of vibratory trauma to the throat. So if your throat vibrates the whole night because of the snoring, that causes trauma that contributes to a sore throat. Also because, you know, when you're breathing against a blockage, the increased negative pressure that has to be generated to draw air in ends up drawing acid up from your stomach and that acid that comes up causes the sore throat. Because of the arousals, patients will complain of other symptoms like unrefreshed sleep, excessive daytime tiredness, as well as mood disturbances in some. So when you go to your ENT doctor, we would assess your upper airway to see which areas contribute to your OSA. The upper airway is from the nose and mouth all the way to the voice box. So each of these areas from the nose and mouth to the voice box would be systematically assessed to see which areas contribute to the sleep apnea. So in the nose, this is a normal nose where, where there's a lot of space for air to flow. Compare this to a patient with allergic rhinitis or what laymen like to call sinus whereby there's a lot of swelling in the nose you see that there's hardly any space this patient has a deviate, deviation of the septum or a bent nose such that air cannot flow well through the nose going a bit further back from the nose down to the back of the throat or the palate area common areas of block of common contributors of obstruction include big tonsils sometimes the palate is too loose so you compare this patient with with a normal palate, whereby you can actually look down from behind and see a big wide airway, this OSA patient has a very narrow airway. Going beyond the throat, we also look at the back of the tongue. The tongue, obstruction at the back of the tongue can be caused by several factors, such as an excessively fat tongue. So, you know, when you, as you put on weight, fat gets deposited all over your body. The tongue is also a common area where fat gets deposited. So because the oral cavity or the mouth is a fixed space, as your tongue gets bigger, it tends to get pressed against the teeth harder. And so sometimes we tend to see this scalloping of the tongue that will indicate that the patient's tongue is large relative to the size of the mouth. Sometimes at the back of the tongue, there's also increased growth of ling lingual tonsils, which are tonsils at the back of the tongue that can narrow the airway. So comparing a normal patient with a very wide airway compared to an OSA patient where it's very narrow. But ultimately, the best way, or rather the only way, to determine whether or not, not you have sleep apnea is to do a sleep study. Sleep studies, there are several forms that can be done, broadly divided into inpatient studies, whereby you sleep in the hospital, and we observe you, uh, we observe your breathing, your heart rate, your oxygen levels to see whether or not you have sleep apnea, compared to a home study. 
So there are several reasons why your doctor may, may say that you are more suited to a home study or an inpatient study. Ultimately, the studies that are done in the hospital are considered the gold standard. They are the most accurate. And you know, if you are a bit hesitant about coming to stay in the hospital, especially in the current climate, uh, rest assured that, you know, especially, especially in our Sing Health Sleep Center, we have a single room, regardless of whatever class status you are paying for, single room with an attached toilet, and this is in the community hospital away from the sick patients. So yeah, don't, don't let that be a reason why, why you want to defer seeking help. So once diagnosed with sleep apnea, what are some of the forms of treatment? Uh, the truth is, you know, OSA is not just purely an anatomy, anatomical disease whereby a surgeon can deal with it. You know, you have to, uh, patients have to play their part. So patients have to evaluate their sleep hygiene together with the doctor to see what could be worsening it, like smoking or alcohol intake, for example. Weight management is important because, like I mentioned, fat around the neck and chin contributes to compression of the upper airway. And then, you know, your doc you and your doctor can then have a discussion to decide what the best form of treatment will be. It can be in the form of using a CPAP machine, uh, whereby the sleep technicians will help you with it. It could be with the use of a dental appliance, or it could tr be through surgery. So coming to a sleep center like ours, I mean, over here, we have, we have the whole, whole uh, spectrum of uh, treatment options for you. So the best form of treatment is CPAP. CPAP is a short form for continuous positive airway pressure. In essence, you wear a mask that is connected to a machine by the bedside. It pumps air in at a higher pressure that keeps the airway open. So I like to show this picture because I myself have OSA and you know, I, I do surgery for everyone, but I, I can tell you CPAP is the most effective and I use CPAP every night. But the problem with CPAP is that not everyone can sleep with a machine or rather with a mask strapped to their face. Studies have shown that the non-compliance rate can actually go up as high as 80%. So for patients that can't use CPAP, what are some of the alternatives that can be considered? An oral appliance is something that can also be considered Essentially, it's something that you wear in your mouth at night. If you look at this picture, you wear it at, in your mouth at night, it positions your jaw, your lower jaw forwards relative to your upper jaw. And because your upper jaw, your lower jaw is positioned forward, your airway is bigger. But this is not without its problems in, in some patients as well, because it can cause a muscle ache at night. Imagine your jaw being pushed forward the whole night. It can cause salivation. It can cause movements of the teeth. And it's not suitable for those that are very obese or those with poor teeth because it can uh, result in teeth damage. So apart from conservative treatments, surgery can also be considered. Ultimately, surgery is done in sleep apnea patients for several reasons. It is either done to complement the use of CPAP or uh, oral device. So for example, some patients have a very blocked nose or very large tonsils such that using a device is very uncomfortable because the machine has to pump air in through a very narrow path. In some cases, we do surgery to, to allow them to use the machine more comfortably. In patients that cannot tolerate a CPAP machine or an oral device, sometimes we try to see whether surgery is, is, a, is, is possible to try to cure the patient of the problem. So as you go down from, you know, if you, if you, if you try to do surgery to try to cure the patient, then of course, Sometimes it's more invasive because we have to do surgeries to multiple levels to try to open up the airway. So how do we determine which part of the airway is blocked? We determine it through this process called drug-induced sleep endoscopy. Essentially what we do is we have an anesthetist on board that gives you a sedative such that you fall asleep and we put a scope in to determine exactly which part blocks up at night. Uh, and then based on the area of blockage, and the pattern of blockage, we can let you know which areas we think need surgery and what the chances of surgery working are. So once we have that plan based on the drug-induced sleep endoscopy, we can do surgery to straighten the septum of the nose, to trim the turbinates, to remove tonsils, to tighten the palate such that it doesn't uh, flop and collapse as much, such that the airway is stabilized. An especially difficult area to deal with is actually at the back of the tongue and the epiglottis area. Like in this patient with a very big lingual tonsil at the back of the tongue, so in, in, this, uh, in this CT scan, you can see that the airway is blocked by this lingual tonsil. 
reaching this area at the back of the tongue is very difficult. In SGH, you know, we commonly use the robot to reach this area. In fact, uh, we were, we, you know, back in 2014, we were the unit that first described its use in Singapore. Uh, the overall success rate back then was 90%, and we have uh, greatly more numbers than, than then, and uh, it is effective in properly selected patients. But, you know, if, you, if you've gone on enough forums, you've listened to enough talks, you know, I think a responsible ENT surgeon must tell you that ultimately, the success rate of sleep apnea surgery, if you're talking about doing soft tissue surgery, is only between 60 to 70%. So why is it that, you know, even though we try to find out where exactly is blocked and we tackle those areas, the success rate is still not 100%. The reason for this is because if you think about the upper airway and the contributors to sleep apnea, soft tissue is only one component. You know, it must be selected in, in uh, uh, it must be, it, can only, it should only be done in properly selected patients. If the main problem is obesity, where fat is compressing on the upper airway, even if you clear the inside of the airway of soft tissue, the airway is still going to be narrow. Also, you know, if, in patients, if the main, in some patients where the main problem is a small jaw, even if we do surgery to the soft tissue inside, the jaw is small to begin with and the airway is still small and vulnerable to collapse. So take for example, I, use, I like to use this analogy, right? So this is a patient with a small jaw and sleep apnea. Even if we remove all the furniture inside, even if you do soft tissue surgery, still a small airway. So in this group of patients where jaw, jaw issues are a problem, you know, what we do is we do maxillomandibular advancement whereby we cut down the upper and lower jaws, we pull it forward such that the caliber of the airway increases. And ultimately, you know, this, this is a, it sounds drastic, but it is a very effective way of treating OSA. Uh, this is a, a, has been shown through many studies that show that the success rate, 86%, cure rate is high, and results longevity of results is high. So just take this example of this case we recently had a couple of weeks back. This was a pre-surgery pre, uh, pre x-ray and this is a post-surgery x-ray. You see all the plates and nails that we use to pull the jaw forward. So we did this surgery together with our dental surgeons. This, uh, this surgery is typically not done by ENT alone. It's a collaborative effort with our dental colleagues from Dental Center. So you see that after we pull the jaws forward, the airway size has increased drastically compared to previous. So, are these just all the options that we have? You know, I think what's interesting is what's coming up in the very near future. Um, there's this thing called hyperglossal nerve stimulation, which in essence, you know, is a bit like those products that you see that work on the principle of electrostimulation of muscles to increase tone and size. Uh, hyperglossal nerve stimulation is where, whereby an implant it's actually implanted under the patient's skin in the chest. And this implant has two wires, one that goes to your intercostal muscles or your rib muscles, and one that goes directly to your hypoglossal nerve, which is the nerve that controls your tongue. So what happens is that patients with this implant would turn on the implant at night before they sleep. And such that every time they breathe at night, a current actually gets transmitted to the nerve that controls their tongue that prevents their tongue from falling backwards and blocking up the airway. So, you know, this, this device is a very small device that can be implanted, just like a pacemaker, like, like other devices that are implanted medically, like a cochlear implant as well. Um, this device has been in use in the US and the European countries for about five years, actually almost seven years. Five-year data has been reported with very good sustained success rates uh, over five years. So we're hoping that this device comes into Asia and, and Singapore next year. And so, you know, if you run out of options, you know, you could always come to talk to us. And, you know, if, if when, when this device is in, we could discuss whether or not this is something one would want to, whether it's something you want to consider or not. So the take-home mass message is that OSA is multifactorial, can be caused by jaw structure, obesity, soft tissue hypertrophy. Come seek us. If you think you have OSA, seek help and let's see what the problem is. It is a major health problem. It has significant long-term medical uh, consequences. CPAP is still the best. I suggest you use CPAP if you can. I use CPAP, you know, but if you can't, then don't, don't give up. You know, there are surgical treatments that can be explored and we can see whether it is suitable for you or not. Yep. So thank you.
All right. <clears throat> All right. I hope you uh, found that, that overview uh, useful for yourself. Um, in our next talk, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Peng. Dr. Peng is one of our associate consultants in the department, and uh, he'll be talking about uh, the nose and OSA, uh, mainly how, what, what medical treatments uh, you can use for the nose to optimize your sleep. Um, please keep your questions coming on in on the chat. Uh, we'll try to answer it as many as we can as the talks go on. And uh, for some of the, the, the real burning questions, we'll answer it live at the end of all the talks uh, later on during the Q&A session. So uh, without further, further ado, uh, Dr. Peng, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Lu. Let's have Dr. Peng with his part to share. Yeah. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for joining us on a Saturday morning. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Peng. I'm actually one of the um, associate consultants from the SJH ENT department. So um, just let me load my slides. So today what I'll be talking on is uh, the medical management of uh, nasal obstruction in OSA. Uh, thanks a lot to uh, Dr. Sean for such a comprehensive overarching talk. Uh, my focus will mainly be for the patients who uh, have just come in with nasal obstruction or if uh, they are not keen for surgery. Um, there are actually many uh, medical options we have to actually treat uh, your problem, especially if you have uh, uh, associated sleep apnea. Uh, no disclosures. Um, so I, I found this a very interesting slide because it gives you an overview of all the possible causes of nasal obstruction. So um, it can range from anything from trauma, tumors, infections, allergies. So uh, as you can see, a multitude of uh, different uh, medical conditions can actually cause nasal obstruction. So if we actually go through every one of them, um, you know, each of them will actually be its own lecture. So what I've chosen to do is actually to focus on the, uh, the most common cause of persistent nasal obstruction. Uh, medically, it's actually known as allergic rhinitis, but you know, in, within our Singaporean population, uh, we do often call it sinus problem. Um, the main characteristics of uh, this um, allergic rhinitis, so you would find that in the mornings, you wake up with a blocked nose, a runny nose, uh, maybe some sneezing and a bit of a nasal itch. Some patients also have a bit of red and itchy eyes, and these symptoms are typically worse with dust exposure. If you have these uh, collection of symptoms, uh, it is likely that you have allergic rhinitis, and it is actually very common in our Singaporean population. Uh, this allergic rhinitis, uh, as Dr. Sean has mentioned earlier, actually can uh, very often contribute to OSA as well, so treating it um, would be relevant uh, in the context of um, patients who actually snore. There have been many medical studies uh, in the literature that actually look at nasal obstruction and sleep. So this uh, study, for example, actually looked at the different dimensions of sleep uh, and whether allergic rhinitis actually worsened them. So uh, through the study, they did some questionnaires uh, and they did some testings with validated tools. So did it show that uh, various aspects of sleep, such as um, whether your sleep was refreshed, whether it affected your concentration, uh, these were all actually affected in patients with allergic rhinitis. And the postulated mechanism was that the allergic rhinitis actually blocks up a part of your breathing passage and that actually worsened the condition uh, such as sleep, different conditions like that, such as sleep apnea. Uh, in another study, it even more specifically looked at the association with severe nasal obstruction on the severity of obstructive sleep apnea. Um, this study was, um, the conclusion wasn't that uh, definitive uh, as compared to the previous one, in the sense that they did show that treating nasal obstruction did reduce uh, various symptoms of sleep apnea. So reduce your mouth breathing, did reduce your tiredness, and it also actually reduced the actual sleep apnea severity index. However, the condition of sleep apnea wasn't actually completely treated with um, relieving the nasal obstruction. So even if you treat the blocked nose, you can still have some residual sleep apnea. So that's one thing to uh, actually keep in mind. Uh, in my mind, um, there's only quite a limited um, 
population of patients who actually can have their sleep apnea cured with nasal obstruction relief. So if, for example, you are young, um, you are very slim, and your main complaint is actually nasal obstruction, yes, it is possible that treating the blocked nose can actually almost cure the sleep apnea. But for most other patients, uh, it's just to relieve the severity. But that being said, it's still a worthwhile endeavor mainly because with relieving the nasal obstruction and improving the severity, you can get improved sleep symptoms as well. Um, this is a very typical classification uh, used by ARIA. So that's actually uh, a, a group uh, of collaborators that come together to look at the evidence on sleep apnea and asthma. So um, on the left side, as you can see, uh, it's been divided into whether your symptoms are intermittent uh, and whether they are mild. So um, whether having intermittent or persistent symptoms, you say more or less than four times a week. But I want, to, I want you to uh, avert your eyes to the bottom of the table. So um, what we consider mild will be if you have normal sleep, despite having a blocked nose, normal work and school activities, uh, and no disturbing symptoms. So that would be considered mild allergic rhinitis. And that's something to be, in general, not to be too worried about. However, if you look on the bottom right of the table, uh, if you have anything such as disturbed sleep, you know, if it affects your work and school, and in fact, other activities like sports, um, that will be classified under moderate to severe. And at that point in time, it may be worthwhile to seek medical attention, uh, be it the general practitioner or even a specialist, because that has shown to have a significant impact on your life. Why allergic rhinitis is important as well? Because there are many, many other associated uh, clinical um, conditions. So, for example, if you have asthma, yeah, that can actually be made worse and it's related to allergic rhinitis. Other conditions like sinusitis, nasal polyps, and even having a cough, cold, and flu, these have been shown to be increased in patients with allergic rhinitis. So, actually keeping the um, so-called sinus problem under control will actually improve your other symptoms um, from your other conditions. So when we see a patient in clinic, um, well, how do we actually diagnose allergic rhinitis? So that's a, a common question that my patients ask me. Primarily, actually, just the history and examination itself would be actually enough. So if you come in telling me that you, know, you have a blocked nose, runny nose, worse of dust exposure, 90, 95, 99% of the time, it would just likely, very likely be allergic rhinitis, and no other tests would actually be needed. We will start you on a trial of treatment, and it improves that uh, inadvertently confirms the diagnosis. However, in patients where the diagnosis is uncertain or if they really want to confirm the diagnosis, um, there are two other tests that we uh, offer at a hospital. So um, one is in vivo, which means from, from or in the body. So we can do a skin prick test and uh, attach on the right side of the slide, you can see a photo of a typical uh, skin prick test device. So what uh, we actually do is on each of the, the little probes that you can see that looks like a, a leg, um, we actually put some of the uh, potential different allergens that we can get in the environment and we actually introduce it to the skin. And depending on um, whether the skin has a small rash or a big rash, we actually know um, whether you are allergic to um, different allergens or not. The other test that we have is in vitro, which means uh, in a glass. So these tests, uh, such as the RAS and Immunocap, um, these are tests that actually we extract a portion of your blood and put it uh, through a special uh, measuring device that can actually measure uh, and see what allergens uh, your blood is actually sensitive to. So in patients who don't want to do the skin prick test or uh, can't do the skin prick test due to various reasons, um, we actually can do a different, it's a very simple blood test that actually gives us a whole um, panel of what uh, potential allergens that may be causing your problems. Um, in my mind, there are three, three main pillars of allergic rhinitis management. So they would be allergen avoidance, pharmacotherapy, which means uh, use of medications, and immunotherapy, which means changing and modulating your immune system. And that's something I'll touch on a little bit more in my later slides. Um, these, um, to note, these can happen all at the same time. So it's not uh, like you have to do one of them uh, just at each point in time. So that can all be done together. So um, the first point which I would like to bring up is actually allergen avoidance. So um, actually controlling the environment of any dust or any allergens that you can be potentially uh, be sensitive to can actually improve the symptoms. 
Um, this table is um, from the clinical practice guidelines from the American associations. Um, and actually, um, this was published in 2015, but I find it very relevant uh, in allergic rhinitis uh, still. So uh, as you can see, the table is actually split into two. So evidence supporting reduction in allergen level and allergen supports reduction symptoms. It's very interesting because the various environmental control measures that has been, have been listed, um, it, it, you, can, you can see that removing um, pets, washing your pets, even using pesticides to kill dust mites, these can all actually reduce the allergen level. Right, but the actual interesting part to note that despite having the reduction in allergen level, um, the symptoms, your symptoms may actually not be reduced. So only three things actually help to reduce your symptoms. Number one, removal of pets. So in patients, um, I mean, even though by and large, um, dust mites are the most common cause of allergic rhinitis, um, certain things like cat hair, dog fur can actually cause allergic rhinitis as well. Right, so if that is the main allergen you are sensitive to, removing your pets uh, can, yes, definitely reduce the symptoms. But you know, as you can imagine, your pet, uh, many patients wouldn't want to remove their pets. So uh, that's something that uh, may be a bit more difficult to achieve, uh, admittedly. Um, the second one, acaricides. So these are just pesticides, a few dust mites. And yes, these actually can actually reduce symptoms. Um, I find a lot of my patients don't actually like use pesticides. Um, so uh, alternative, which has um, quite good evidence in the medical literature, would be actually to wash your bed sheets regularly, at least once a week, and um, in hot water as well. So if your washing machine has the settings uh, to increase the, the washing temperature to 60 degrees and above, that has been found to be very efficient. And this is actually a good alternative to pesticides. Um, finally, um, combined use of multiple control measures. And yes, um, the evidence does support um, that multiple measures used at the same time can actually reduce symptoms. But by and large, these would include uh, one of the previous two, so either removing the pets or using the, the pesticides. So actually, you know, you can do all these measures, you know, use the special covers, air filtration, and that can actually reduce the allergen level, but having your symptoms improve, you know, that may not be the case. And the reason is because even a small amount of dust or allergen can actually cause very severe symptoms. So that's something very interesting to note. Uh, moving along, the second point. Um, so as you can see in my previous slides, pharmacotherapy. So that actually means um, using different medications to control your symptoms. Um, this is quite a busy slide. And, and the reason I've put everything is just for you to understand there are so many things that we can actually use to control your allergic rhinitis. So don't worry about the bulk of them. The important, the important ones have actually been highlighted in red. And these are the only two, two things that have actually shown to be uh, significantly useful uh, in our clinical practice guidelines. So on the left side, acutely. So that means in the immediate instance, if you are having a very bad day, if really blocked, a really blocked nose or a really runny nose, you can use oral antihistamine. So things like um, Telfa, Sirtec, Claritine, Loretidine. All these medications do give you instant relief, but we don't normally uh, encourage patients to take them long term. Um, mainly because there are other associated side effects like tightness, you know, a dry mouth, um, but you can use it um, if necessary. Uh, on the right side, uh, for maintenance, so this is actually long-term control of symptoms. The main um, port of call and our main actually um, a weapon we use in our armamentarium will be that of nasocorticosteroids or nasosteroids. And a lot of these will be very familiar uh, to you if you have had uh, this uh, allergic rhinitis diagnosed already. So things like Nasonex, Nasocort, Avamis, um, these are actually all nasal sprays that can actually help to control your symptoms. I do tell my patients though that if you start yourself on nasal steroids, you should use it regularly because um, many studies have also shown that uh, it does take one to two weeks for the nasal steroids to actually reach a steady state. So to reach a amount on your nose that can actually help symptoms. So if you have a blocked nose today and if you just use your nasal sprays when you have the blocked nose, that won't be very helpful at all. So remember, if you're nasal sprays, use it regularly. Um, yeah, SGH, we also offer a very interesting and quite a new drug. So um, it's called Dimista. So this is actually a combination of both the nasal steroids and the antihistamine, uh, which were the two drugs I mentioned earlier. So not only does it actually give you the control over a long period of time, but using it can actually give you quite quick relief on the day itself as well. So that's one thing that's actually quite uh, available uh, and actually quite useful 
um, for patients with allergic rhinitis if you find that the other nasal sprays have not been useful thus far. Unfortunately, um, uh, as, far as, I can, uh, as far as I know, it's not available in the polyclinic at the moment. So uh, if you do want to try this out, you would have to come to the hospital to get a prescription for this. And this is just an, another paper from the clinical practice guidelines that actually shows that the nasal steroids, uh, the the combined nasal steroids and intranasal antihistamines, which is what I showed you before, Dimista, has actually better benefit as compared to just a pure nasal steroid alone. Um, finally, in the third part of call, we have uh, immunotherapy. So it's actually a technique whereby we introduce specific allergens. So prior to that, we will test you to see what allergen you are sensitive to. And we can actually introduce these allergens in small amounts to your body so that your body gets used to it, so to speak. And it induces tolerance, which means that you're, after you have built up a certain level of uh, being familiar with this allergen, if you have further exposures, let's say from your bed sheets or maybe uh, even uh, from your cat, you know, if you are particularly uh, susceptible to cat fur, um, this can actually reduce the subsequent response. So once you've built up the tolerance, you know, if you get exposed again, your symptoms like blood nose, runny nose, sneezing, and itchy nose, those will be much reduced. Um, there are a certain uh, characteristics of patients that can't have it, uh, unfortunately. So if you're pregnant, you have, you know, you have some immune system problem, severe asthma, all these, you can't have immunotherapy. But by and large, most patients can actually have this and will benefit from this. Uh, and um, and from, as you see from the diagram uh, in the top right, um, the, how it works is actually they put a pill or tablet uh, under your tongue and that actually goes into your system. Alternatively, uh, we do have other drugs that are actually a droplet that you actually put under your tongue. Um, in terms of immunotherapy, there are actually two or three different kinds. Um, so what we offer at SGH would be SLIT or sublingual immunotherapy. So as mentioned earlier, there are two forms, the tablet form and the liquid form. Um, the tablet form is called Acarizax and it's really convenient. It's a small tablet just put under your tongue. Uh, you have to use it once a day, uh, uh, unfortunately. But uh, other than that, um, when we start patients on these, they find that you know after the treatment has reached a certain level, they don't even have to use their regular medications uh, such as nose sprays anymore. Um, it is a little more expensive at about $150 per month, um, but the convenience is actually quite good. So that's something to consider. The other sort of immunotherapy that we have here uh, that is under slit will be dieter, and that is uh, immunotherapy in a liquid form. So it's a lot cheaper. So around half. Uh, the price of a uh, tablet form, uh, so $60 a month. Um, but the problem about it is actually it's in a liquid form. So if you travel a lot, that may be a bit inconvenient because you've got to store it uh, at, a certain, uh, at a certain cool temperature as well. But these are the main two things we have here. Recently, we have actually introduced um, cat uh, immunotherapy as well, cat epithelia or cat fur. So uh, we can actually also uh, obtain a purified form of cat fur that we can actually introduce to your body to build tolerance as well. So if you're a cat owner, you love your cat, but you, know, you just can't help but keep sneezing, having the itchy nose with your cat around, that's something to consider as well. And uh, on the top right with all the photos, these are just typical images of the different dust mites that um, we have in our environment and particularly in the bed sheets that can actually um, cause um, these problems. The good thing about immun immunotherapy is that 90% of patients are able to actually stop and discontinue therapy after about three to five years. So for typical patients after three years, if their symptoms are under control, I'll tell the patient, well, you know, we can actually stop the therapy and see how long these uh, effects actually last. And most of them actually do quite well uh, from our experience. Um, the effects actually last for quite a long time, for anywhere between eight to 10 years. Uh, after that, there's definitely the option to restart the immunotherapy again. But we have many patients who feel liberated after completing immunotherapy because you know, it, it can be quite a burden to have to use the nasal sprays and take the antihistamines lifelong. This is something we can consider for patients who don't like to take um, you know, these uh, sort of chronic medications. In the last part of my talk, I'll just go through um, two or three very typical questions uh, that patients normally come to me with. So uh, by, by far, most, um, the most common question that patients ask me is, hey doc, you know, are nasal steroids dangerous? So, well, um, I guess the general answer would be they are generally safe. Um, there are some main side effects uh, such as nasal dryness. 
But um, this is actually what you want, right? You want the nose lining to be dry. You don't want all the wet and sticky mucus inside. So um, they are generally quite safe. <clears throat> um, there are certain conditions um, which you know we would say to be a bit more careful in. Um, for example, in uh, pregnant pregnant women, I, I don't normally start nasal steroids. Um, so at least not the ones um, that we have. So that's one thing to consider. But by and large, most people you will tolerate tolerate them quite well, mainly because the amount of steroid that actually enters your bloodstream is quite minimal. It's less than 1%. And we talk about the bioavailability. That means how much of uh, active medicine goes into your blood. So that's quite minimal. So don't worry. Um, it's actually very safe to use. Uh, another question that um, patients normally come to me with is, uh, will these medications kill me? Um, the answer is actually quite clear. The answer is actually no. Um, because once you stop the medications, uh, symptoms tend to come back. I mean, you can think of this um, like a chronic condition, such, such as you know, hypertension or high blood pressure, even diabetes, right? It's something that you have to live with, but something that we can actually control with regular medications. And the reason for that is actually the, uh, it's by and large a genetic component. So it's often related um, to a family history. So very likely if you have allergic rhinitis, your father or your mother would have had it as well. And it's something that we pass on to our children as well. I myself have allergic rhinitis and my son does get um, quite a sensitive nose as well, uh, particularly at night, right? So it's something that we, we can't actually cure, cure per se, um, but the medications can actually control symptoms quite well and coupled together with other uh, things such as um, you know, your medications, and even possibly immunotherapy, we can actually have very good control um, you know, uh, without having uh, very drastic symptoms. And, and the one, uh, the last common question that patients ask me, or rather that I have heard being asked, uh, actually more at the GP level, would be when to see the ENT specialist. So um, there, in my mind, there are a few red flags or a few conditions that um, would be uh, useful. So um, persistent symptoms decide medication. So if you're having really, you know, debilitating symptoms, can't breathe at night, you know, it affects your sleep. Yes, we can definitely see you. Uh, and we can offer you alternatives or even surgery, which um, my colleague, Dr. Shi, would uh, actually expound on uh, later on. Uh, number two, patients seeking alternatives to chronic medications. So if you don't want to take medications, yes, we can see you as well. And we can offer you different things to actually treat your problem. Finally, patients with red flags, such as blocked nose, uh, oh, sorry, um, nosebleeds, blocked ears, and any onset of blocked nose, particularly in adults. So if your nose has been fine all this time, but suddenly, you know, in the past two or three months, you've had a blocked nose, uh, I think that's something that um, we should consider uh, sending to the specialist. And as you can see in the picture, what we can do is actually to offer a nasal scope. That, um, it's quite a small device that we can do in our clinic in a day surgery setting. And it allows us to evaluate patients with these red flags just to make sure there are no um, you know, undiagnosed infections, undiagnosed tumors, which can present uh, in the ways I've listed below. So that's the end of my talk. I hope uh, it has been informative for everyone. Um, if you have any questions, you, know, you can ask them now or we can actually keep them uh, for our Q&A at the end of our session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Peng, for your sharing. Okay, uh, now we'll move on to the second part of this, uh, the talk, which will be the, medic the surgical management of nasal obstruction in OSA, which will be presented by Dr. Xu Shuhui, Associate Consultant from the department. Dr. Xu, please. Big. Hi, thank you, Shafiq, and thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Peng, for the very comprehensive talk. Okay. Okay, can. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Shu Hui. I'm one of the associate consultants from uh, SGH ENT, and uh, I'm very happy to be here today to give a short introduction on the nose surgeries that we do to help with uh, nasal obstruction as well as obstructive sleep apnea. 
uh, and I hope that at the end of the talk, you have a little bit more information and understanding uh, if you are suffering from blocked nose, uh, but not improving with the medical uh, methods that uh, Dr. Kung has alluded to earlier. Okay, so I have no disclosures or affiliations, nor am I receiving any royalties for some of the equipments that I mentioned along the way. So let's start off by imagining our nose to be a hollow air-filled pipe. Uh, so any barriers along the way can result in the sensation of blocked nose or can give rise to snoring and OSA as mentioned. So um, for instance, this green circle represents a foreign body in the nose. Uh, this is seen, of course, more of, uh, commonly in children uh, who attempt to put rolled up tissue paper, grapes, Lego, etc. up their noses. Uh, but in adults, uh, obstruction more commonly occurs in structures that already are present in the nose. For instance, uh, the inferior turbinates or adenoids, um, uh, which I will uh, explain further later. And uh, there can also be growths such as polyps. And then very, very rarely, there can also be tumors that give rise to blockage of the nose due to narrowing of the passage. Uh, and lastly, if the wall of the pipe is not tough enough, it can collapse and narrow the breathing passage when there is a large uh, inflow of air. Uh, for those who are familiar with physics, uh, this is due to the Venturi effect in which uh, there is a drop in pressure with a large flow of air uh, resulting in constriction of the passage. So let's apply this pipe to the nose. This is a side view of the nose. And then let's correlate the structures that we've seen earlier in the diagram. So basically the nose functions to transmit air from the ambient environment down into our lungs. And uh, there is also a corresponding parallel passage in our mouth. Uh, so that's why patients with blocked nose tend to breathe through their mouths. And for patients with uh, obstructive sleep apnea with uh, the nose being one of the components, you can see that they sleep with their mouths open. Uh, and this structure known as the inferior turbinate, and you can see it is inferior because there are, there's the middle and the superior turbinates here. But the inferior turbinates usually are the largest uh, structures in the nose that can give rise to blocked nose. Um, and they can be enlarged in situations as uh, Dr. Peng has alluded to earlier, such as uh, allergic rhinitis. Uh, and the, what I mentioned earlier about the uh, wall weakening, this occurs usually at the area of the nasal valve, which is at the front portion of the nose. Okay, so let us now go into more detail. I will split the talk into causes that are externally visible. For instance, the nasal valve collapse and those that are not immediately visible to view. So we'll start off with uh, external uh, causes of nasal obstruction. So if you see your own nose, it is made up of a series of overlapping cartilage and bone. And uh, there are two main pairs of cartilages, the lower lateral cartilage here and the upper lateral cartilage here. And there's an overlap region here at which the internal nasal valve is located. And of course, at the topmost portion, there is the nasal bone. So if you feel your own nose, the middle part will be firm. But if you feel a little bit upwards and to the side, there's an area here that's a little bit soft. And uh, this corresponds to the green region here, which is known as the internal nasal valve. Uh, there's also this uh, external circle here, which corresponds to the external nasal valve. And it is a soft portion because it is just made up of uh, soft tissue and skin. So the external nasal valve can collapse uh, if the underlying support is weak especially when you take a deep breath in like that. Uh, this is due to uh, the venturi effect as I've alluded to earlier. So this can happen in patients without symptoms, uh, but for patients who do have uh, complaints of nasal obstruction, we will need to evaluate, evaluate thoroughly from externally to internally to make sure that we address all these portions. So uh, I will now show this video. As you can see, the patient's side wall collapses inwards as he takes a deep breath in. And this can give rise to the sensation of blocked nose, especially when the patient needs to take deep breaths, for instance, during exercise. And also, it can also occur during uh, sleep when the patients have a blocked nose at night 
and when they breathe in and are unable able to get good airflow, they will breathe even harder and it results in a negative feedback loop. So what can we do about this? Surgically, we can correct this by using uh, the, the, uh, the stronger structures surrounding the nose to support the weak cartilage. And we do this by hitching up the weak cartilage to the stronger bone adjacent to it using uh, stitches, sutures. And this patient shown in the video has undergone the surgery. So as you can see, there's a collapse of the side wall when he takes a deep breath in. And after surgery, uh, we are asking him to breathe in hard and there's no movement because the cartilage has been supported to the bone at the side. So other surgical methods to uh, support the cartilage may require more extensive procedures uh, and it is known as uh, open septal rhinoplasty. And we say open because uh, this requires a small incision uh, at, the, at the bottom part of the nose over here. Um, this incision usually heals very well and it will become invisible over a few months. Uh, and basically what we need to, what is done during this surgery is to support the cartilage or the weakened cartilage further with cartilage from other parts of our bodies, which can be from the ear or from our ribs. Uh, we also have synthetic materials available, so your surgeon will choose the appropriate materials for your surgery. Uh, lastly, other causes that can give rise to uh, blocked nose, there's a uh, externally visible. I think this was uh, one of the questions that one of the one of you have put up also, is that there can be a deformity of the nose. This is known as a saddle nose deformity in which you can see that there's sinking of the middle part of the nose at the junction between the bone and the cartilage. And uh, where does this happen? Um, this usually arises from previous injury to the nose or if the patient has had previous surgeries to the nose that result in poor support. And uh, I think more commonly overseas, uh, there can be issues like drug abuse and things like that, which can cause a perforation in the septum in the middle of the nose. So uh, we can do surgery to correct this and straighten up the nose and correct the, the, the nasal obstruction. So now I'll move on to uh, inter internal causes of nasal obstruction. By far, the most common cause would be this condition known as turbinate enlargement. As we've seen in the diagram earlier, the turbinate is actually a bony structure that is lined by uh, expansile soft tissue. And um, this is normal and abnormal, but actually in every, uh, everybody, there's a normal nasal cycle in which the lining of the nose takes turns to expand in every, every two to six hours only. Uh, but for some patients who are chronically uh, allergic, this may be always enlarged. So if you can see uh, from the bottom up view, um, some patients may have uh, very, very enlarged turbinates that actually gives rise to concerns about growth in the nose. We have had seen, we have seen referrals for patients who are concerned uh, because when they feel that their nose is blocked, uh, if they look up in the mirror as in this view, or if they put their fingers into their nose, they can actually feel something there. So not to be worried, this is usually the enlarged inferior turbinate uh, rather than a growth. So what can we do about this? Uh, we have surgeries that address the large bulk of this uh, structure known as the turbinate and uh, they are collated into this term known as turbinate reduction. We have various methods to reduce the size of the turbinates um, so that it opens up the nasal passage a lot more so that you can breathe better. So a uh, more minimally invasive method will be known as a radio frequency or coblation re reduction. Um, what is done is that basically there's a probe that's introduced into the turbinate and this uh, there is a heat or radio frequency waves that are delivered to basically scar the soft tissue so that it doesn't expand when uh, patients come in contact with things they are allergic to. This is a very fast procedure and can be done with uh, the patient awake uh, just in the outpatient clinic. Um, but because uh, it is minimally invasive, some patients may need repeated uh, procedures to achieve the desired outcome. 
uh, probably more conclusive but uh, more involved method would be to do uh, inferior turbinoplasty or turbinectomy in which we actually cut the bone rather than just address the soft tissue. And uh, because there can be bleeding during the surgery, this is usually performed under general anesthesia. Uh, duration of surgery takes a bit longer, uh, about 30 to 60 minutes. But the uh, positive uh, part about uh, offering this surgery is that we can address other parts of the nose that are also uh, without, uh, causing nasal obstruction at the same time, for instance, a septal deviation. So the nasal septum, which is the middle part of the nose, uh, can be deviated. And usually we see some deviation uh, in patients. And the deviation is because um, there is uh, the septum, uh, the nasal septum is, is made up of cartilage as well as bone. And uh, at these joints, they can merge and they can um, uh, protrude out, uh, such as in the concept of tectonic plates. Uh, and then it results in a narrowing of the nasal passage. Um, so this is an endoscopic view into the nose where the, you can see there's a little bit of a septum jutting out at the bottom part of the nose. Um, and we can address this with surgery by straightening it. And uh, if we furthermore reduce the turbinates here, we can see that it will give rise to a much larger nasal passage through which we can breathe. Um, other internal causes of nasal obstruction can be growths or polyps. Uh, polyps are by far more common uh, and they usually arise uh, as a result of a variety of factors. It can be allergies, infection, etc. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people are concerned that they have polyps in the nose when they pro probably feel um, a structure in the nose. But most of the time, the, those are not polyps because unless the polyps are really, really large, they don't uh, come all the way to the front of the nose. Um, they are mostly deep inside the nose but they still can give rise to the sensation of obstruction because the nasal passage is blocked by the presence of the polyps. So surgery to remove polyps uh, is known as uh, endoscopic sinus surgery, uh, which is done entirely using the endoscope with no external cuts. Uh, and we use a variety of instruments that cut and debride and open up the uh, passageway to remove the polyps. But what is more important is that during the surgery, we will re reduce the surface area uh, of the polyp, uh, of the lining of the nose, so that there is a less chance for the polyps to recur. Uh, and lastly, but not least, um, this, there are these structures at the back of the nose, they are known as uh, adenoids. Um, basically, th these function as a, a, a barrier a line of defense against foreign material coming through the nose. Uh, the equivalent in the mouth are tonsils, which are, I think, uh, uh, more commonly understood. So these adenoids are actually normal, normally enlarged in children, but they should recede in adulthood. But for some patients who have chronic, chron chronically allergic nose, noses with back drip, Sometimes the adenoids can be stimulated to grow and remain enlarged. Uh, then we can do surgery to reduce the, top, the adenoids so that the passageway is more patent. Usually patients with adenoid enlargement tend to complain of uh, blockage of the nose when they lie down to sleep at night because the palate flops backwards when we lie down and closes, closes off this portion. Okay, so um, those are basically the co more common nose surgeries that we can do to address nasal obstruction. Now I'll just go through some of the risks briefly. The nose has a very, very robust blood supply. So the main risk of nose surgery is actually, actually bleeding, um, which occurs about 1 to 10% of patients. It's actually normal to have some amount of blood stain discharged from the nose for about two weeks after surgery. Uh, and this is because we do, do not do any suturing in the nose to close up wounds as we would in external surgery. So whatever we set will be left open and raw. So your surgeon will usually instruct you to um, uh, reduce strenuous activity and uh, to avoid post-operative bleeding. Uh, patients are also concerned that if they undergo surgery, uh, there can be regrowth of the structures uh, resulting in recurrence. So basically, if we resect bone, which is hidden here within the turbinate, 
it will not be grow. But what can be grow is the lining of the nose. We usually will leave a layer of lining on the nose so as to minimize crusting after surgery. Um, if the allergies are not well controlled, technically the, the, the tissue can get re can get swollen again, um, resulting in re repeat narrowing of the nose. But the bulk of the tissue will be gone because the bone will have been excised. Uh, but uh, one important thing to note is to continue using the nose sprays after the surgeries if you still have a significant uh, component of allergy. Okay, uh, crusting can also occur for about two to six weeks after surgery. Uh, this is the equivalent of scabs uh, that we get after injury on our skin. Uh, in the nose, it presents as dried and hardened uh, nasal discharge. Uh, and this is only temporary uh, for after the surgery until the wound heals fully. Uh, this can be minimized and dealt with with nasal douche as seen in this, in this photo. There can also be scarring between the structures. Uh, so it is important for you to have regular follow-ups with your doctors immediately after surgery because this scar usually is very soft and easily dealt with if uh, we encounter it early. Uh, we can just use instruments in the clinic to break this scar. But if uh, the, scars are too, the scar becomes too firm and too copious, very rarely sometimes you may need to go back into operating theatre to lyse this scar. Uh, to prevent scars from form forming, uh, when we do surgery, sometimes we'll put in a plastic splint to block the middle part of the nose, which is the septum, away from the turbinate. Uh, for patients uh, who rarely, there can be this condition known as uh, empty nose syndrome, uh, which can happen when we, if we over-reset the turbinate such that it is too small, um, this is an uncommon condition. Most of the time, patients will experience uh, improvement in nasal blockage after surgery. Uh, this is purportedly due to a change in the airflow sensation due to the lack of turbulence. The patients feel that they, they can't feel air flowing through their nose, even though the passageway is very, very open. So what doctors will do in clinic to diagnose this condition is to rebulk it up with some uh, cotton tissue in the clinic. And uh, if there's improvement in blocked nose after the procedure, then we will diagnose empty nose syndrome. Uh, but this occurs uh, in less than 1% of the cases. And uh, last but not least, uh, if we do need to do septum surgery, the nasal deformity can result as a result of the septal surgery, but this is very uncommon, uh, occurs only in 0.5 to 3% of the cases because we are usually careful not to over reset the septum uh, so that there's uh, sufficient remnant support to the nose. Just some notes on post-operative -operat care. Uh, usually, patients can go home one day after surgery. Uh, if, uh, they recover well from general anesthesia and uh, have no other issues. Um, usually, we'll give two weeks of hospitalization leave for you to rest at home. Uh, dietary, dietary restrictions, uh, you, mainly we will ask patients to avoid hot food because it can cause blood vessels to dilate um, and result in bleeding. We also advise patients to avoid strenuous activity, anything that can increase the heart rate uh, and cause more blood flow through the nose and also no heavy lifting for two to four weeks after surgery. Uh, definitely, we'll advise patients to avoid trauma or injury to the nose, especially after uh, we have done septoplasty because uh, all the cartilages and uh, materials that we put into the nose to support the nose uh, should not shift in position before scarring occurs uh, and lastly, as I mentioned earlier, please be compliant with the nose wash to flush out all the debris, which will help the wound to heal faster. Uh, so because bleeding is a, the main uh, risk of surgery, usually we will try and reduce the risk by putting in packing material in the nose. This can be absorbable or non-absorbable. This is an example of a non-absorbable packing material, which is basically a tampon, an uh, expensable sponge that is put into the nose. Uh, this is usually left in your nose for at most 24 to 48 hours, um, and it will be removed before you go home. But there can be absorbable sponges uh, left in the nose, which will be present for a week or two, uh, 
uh, until you wash it out or the surgeon washes it out for you during the first post-operative visit. Uh, then the nurses and the doctors may advise you to use a dressing to warn under to wear under the nostrils, mainly for your convenience to capture any blood stains that may come out from the nose. Uh, but it also uh, does serve a function for humidification of air. So this is the end of my talk. I'd like to thank uh, Prof To and uh, Dr Chang for sharing some of their patient slides with me. If you have any uh, further questions, uh, you can. Uh, type them into the Q&A box or we will address them at the end of the talk. I hope that you have uh, gained a little bit more understanding into the type of surgeries that we do uh, and uh, it is less intimidating for you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much Dr. Xu for your sharing on surgical management of nasal obstruction in OSA. So last but not least, let's welcome Dr. Leong Tuhao, Associate Consultant, to talk on throat irritation due to silent reflux and its relation to OSA. Dr. Leong, please. Okay, uh, can everybody hear me and uh, see my slides? Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Leong, and I'm an associate consultant with the Department of ENT at the Singapore General Hospital. I have a special interest in uh, voice and swallowing disorders. And uh, so today, this morning, we have already heard three very excellent talks on the topic of obstructive sleep apnea and on its far-reaching uh, implications and relationships with uh, nose disorders. Uh, however, what is less well-known is the relationship between reflux disease and snoring and OSA. And uh, that is my topic uh, for today. Before I move on, just a quick note that I have no conflicts of interest uh, to declare. So in the next 20 minutes, uh, I'll be covering the following points. I hope to explain uh, some of the common symptoms and manifestations of reflux disease uh, and explore the interplay between reflux and snoring. Um, and to end off, leave everybody with a few practical points of uh, what we can do to control this very common but very uh, bothersome uh, condition. <clears throat> so what is reflux disease? Well, statistically speaking, at least 20% of us all here, that means one fifth of us, would have active symptoms of reflux disease in some form currently. And most of us will experience, will experience reflux episodes at least once in our lives. So reflux simply means backflow or, re or the return of flow. And it refers to when gastric contents flow back up the esophagus or food passage. These gastric contents may be gastric juices, partially digested foods, or sometimes even just gas from the stomach. Normally, there are muscles uh, called esophageal sphincters at both ends of the esophagus here and here. Uh, these muscles relax to let food pass downwards into the stomach. Then they tighten again to keep the stomach contents down. But when the lower esophageal sphincter here uh, doesn't tighten enough, acid can flow back and reflux from your stomach into your esophagus. Sometimes, gastric contents even reach higher up to the throat. And when the upper esophageal sphincter doesn't tighten as well, then there will be exposure of the throat to uh, gastric contents. So while the stomach is actually designed to contain acidic contents, the esophagus and the throat are not. And as exposure of the esophagus to acid may cause symptoms such as heartburn and regurgitation, which are the classic symptoms of uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Uh, other symptoms include bloatedness, belching, or, or, or burping. Uh, so heartburn is this sensation of burning uh, or, or pain in your chest, just behind your sternum or your breastbone. And uh, this pain uh, is often worse after eating, in the evening when you are lying down uh, or bending over. Regurgitation is just simply the sense of fluid uh, that is moving up and down in the chest. In the instances when gastric contents travel higher and enter your throat, these may then cause throat symptoms. So common throat symptoms uh, include brash, which is uh, refers to a sour, bitter taste uh, at the back of your throat, especially worse in the morning. Uh, and sometimes uh, halitosis or bad breath can also result from this. But reflux also commonly causes a range of other throat symptoms that people don't commonly associate with it. So sometimes the throat symptoms are the only manifestations of reflux disease and the patients may not necessarily have heartburn or regurgitation. 
So <clears throat> when I tell my patients uh, that their symptoms and that their throat symptoms are caused by reflux, many of them you know, express surprise. You know, how can it be uh, that I have throat symptoms from reflux, but not heartburn and not bloatedness? Um, many times, these patients will remember that their throat symptoms uh, started around the time when they were also experiencing uh, some gastric symptoms of heartburn, etc. However, the gastric symptoms may have stopped, but the throat symptoms uh, have persisted. So the reason for this is that throat symptoms are usually much more stubborn than gastric symptoms. While gastric symptoms are directly related to the presence and the corrosive nature of acid in the esophagus that stimulates pain receptors, uh, which cause pain and discomfort, the mechanism for throat symptoms is slightly different and more uh, complex. So we see that uh, in the throat, symptoms are not just caused by acid, but by other uh, contents in the gastric secretions, such as pepsin, which is a digestive enzyme that digests uh, proteins in your food, and bowel salts, which is also uh, used uh, in the digestion, uh, well, it's also plays a role in the digestion of fat uh, that, we, that we eat. So pepsin can cause uh, uh, damage to the throat uh, through two main means, either by direct irritation, or uh, by indirect effects. So by I mean, pep, the action of pepsin as a digestive enzyme, it causes damage to the lining of the throat. Uh, it depletes uh, cellular defenses uh, and also decreases the producers of mucin and bicarbonate, uh, which causes thicker and more sticky mus mucus production. And because of this inflammation and swelling, uh, uh, and the sensitivity and irritation in the throat. This then leads to symptoms such as globus, which is the sensation of something stuck in the throat, post-nasal drip, uh, frequent throat clearing, and a cough, and even sometimes uh, choking or difficulty swallowing. The indirect uh, effects uh, occur through the stimulation of uh, nerve receptors in our throat. So um, the, the throat area is actually uh, has many, many uh, nerve endings, uh, because it's essential for us to protect our airway. So for example, if you are uh, uh, eating something and it goes down the wrong passage, it goes down your air, uh, your windpipe, uh, your body senses this and you, you react to this by coughing. So to prevent uh, food and water from going down uh, the wrong passage. Uh, but the conversely, these stimulators can be um, uh, chronically stimulated by the gastric contents that come up. And this then causes... Uh, chronic discomfort, itchiness, sensation in the throat. Uh, some patients say there's a burning sensation in the throat and just sensitivity to uh, other uh, stimulants as well. So for example, you may be more sensitive to uh, perfume or bad smells uh, and may also lead to uh, difficulty swallowing. So these are just some of the mechanisms that lead to the many symptoms that uh, patients uh, experience. So to illustrate this, uh, this is an image of the throat as viewed through an endoscope, which is what ENT specialists use to directly visualize and evaluate uh, the throat. Uh, you can see this cross-section reference uh, here. And with this view, we are looking directly uh, at this area. So uh, the entrance to the esophagus or food pipe begins here, whereas the windpipe or trachea is here. Uh, this leads down to the lungs. And uh, these two uh, uh, structures here, this white, Two, uh, these two white structures here are the vocal cords. So when reflux occurs, gastric contents travel up the esophagus and the first point of uh, uh, contact with which we would, would be with the throat uh, tissues here and here. Yeah? And as a result of that, this area, uh, as you can see, uh, looks a bit puffy it is edematous, which means that it is, uh, has uh, accumulation of uh, water in the tissue and it is swollen. So oftentimes when patients complain of a sensation of a lump in the throat or even something foreign stuck in the throat, uh, most times it is this swelling that they are feeling. And uh, obviously, uh, you know, being part of your own body's tissues, uh, this feeling doesn't go away just simply by swallowing or by coughing because uh, yeah, they're still there. The inflammation may also extend further forward to the area behind uh, and around the vocal folds here and here. And uh, this may cause hoarseness and frequent voice breaks. Uh, patients sometimes complain of uh, deterioration in the quality of their voice 
uh, especially for those who require to, uh, you know, to use their voice very heavily in the course of their work or uh, you know, across their day. The vocal folds, as mentioned, are very, very sensitive. So any irritation here may lead to cough or frequent throat clearing. And lastly, seeing the evidence of thick stringy mucus in the throat also points towards uh, reflux disease. So while we now have a better understanding of what reflux disease entails, what about the relationship between reflux disease uh, and snoring? So as uh, Dr. Sean has really uh, pointed out, obstructive sleep apnea refu refers to the condition where there's repetitive upper airway collapse in the throat area or behind the nose and behind the tongue, uh, which causes obstruction of the air passage during sleep. And this obstruction leads to you arousing or waking up slightly during sleep, which then deteriorates your sleep quality. And uh, we see, I mentioned earlier that uh, for, uh, about one-fifth of us, of 20% uh, of us, will have uh, some reflux symptoms currently. But this number actually rises up to 75% uh, if you look at a cohort of patients uh, with OSA. Uh, so 75, almost three, thirds, uh, three quarters of these patients have uh, nighttime symptoms of reflux. So why is this so? So first of all, I mean, there are very... Uh, there are quite a number of shared risk factors between reflux disease uh, as well as uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And this includes uh, increasing age uh, because of uh, increasing laxity of the muscles of the throat uh, and also the increasing laxity of the upper and lower esophageal sphincters. Uh, gentlemen uh, tend to have uh, more problems with both reflux as well as OSA. And of course, as mentioned, uh, obesity, increasing weight and uh, alcohol intake can uh, potentiate these two uh, uh, issues. But further than that, uh, there is sort of an interplay of factors uh, and the physical con consequences of both these conditions serve as sort of a positive feedback loop that make the other worse. So with repetitive airway obstruction in OSA, patients have an increased res respiratory effort during sleep. That is, they are straining to breathe when they are asleep because they are uh, trying to breathe against a fixed obstruction. So they are trying to suck air in, in other words. And this negative pressure or suction force in the chest area then encourages gastric contents to be suctioned upwards or move upwards. Uh, therefore, this causes uh, reflux. Increasing number of reflux episodes with things like heartburn, uh, throat irritation and cough uh, also contribute to nighttime arousals, which uh, further... Uh, worsen sleep quality. And as mentioned earlier, the, the, the swelling and the edema of the throat tissues further narrows the air passage and increases the propensity for the upper airway to collapse, which then uh, worsens uh, the severity uh, and frequency of OSA and may also uh, worsen snoring. So as you can see, the result is a chain of events that is difficult to break completely because uh, if you address one issue and not the other, then uh, uh, the effectiveness of the treatment tends to be uh, limited. So the previous speakers have spoken quite extensively of what can be done for snoring and OSA, but what about uh, reflux? So the good news is that there is a variety of things that can be done to address reflux disease, uh, and those that can be instituted to prevent or lessen the severity of reflux can be done at home without uh, any need for any prescription medication or devices. And of course, in certain situations, uh, further medications are required, uh, and in patients with concurrent OSA and reflux, uh, both must be treated at the same time in order to maximize the effect, uh, effectiveness or efficiency of treatment. Uh, for OSA, uh, as mentioned, uh, the first line uh, treatment is usually the use of a positive airway pressure device or PET device. And uh, sometimes, um, you know, your GP may also decide that you require further specialist evaluation. So let's go through uh, some of these measures uh, together. So firstly, in terms of lifestyle habits, Weight loss uh, or you know, excessive weight is one of the largest uh, contributing factors to both snoring, OSA, and uh, reflux. Uh, so the excessive uh, fat in the abdomen increases the pressure uh, on the, the diaphragm uh, which, uh, and the stomach, which causes uh, uh, reflux episodes. And of course, excessive neck fat uh, increases the likelihood of airway collapse uh, as well. Smoking also uh, irritates the throat lining, contributes further to uh, throat-related uh, swelling and edema, 
uh, and uh, if patients continue to smoke, then even with treatment, it is much harder for the inflammation to settle down because uh, the irritation uh, you know, continues. And uh, cigarette smoke has also been shown to uh, relax the lower esophageal sphincter and increases uh, reflux episodes. And last but not least, a more, mi a more minor point, a tight-fitting clothing uh, can place pressure on the stomach, which also increases reflux. Moving on to dietary habits. So there are a variety of foods uh, that sort of uh, make reflux worse. Uh, and this includes uh, mainly sour or acidic fruits, such as uh, you know, citrus fruits, orange, lemons, uh, and also uh, caffeine, caffeinated drinks like coffee, tea, or even carbonated drinks uh, like Coke. Uh, spicy, oily fried food uh, uh, can uh, also uh, contribute to this. And uh, <laughs> last but not least, even chocolate. Uh, can uh, you know cause and worsen reflux. So um, uh, what has been suggested in the literature is this thing called a Mediterranean diet, or rather a diet that is low in fat and sugar, but high in protein, uh, and also uh, alkaline or plant-based diet. So uh, there have been some papers that show that if, just by solely following uh, this Mediterranean diet, uh, there has been significant improvement in uh, symptoms of both gastric reflux as well as throat-related reflux. And last but not least, but perhaps most important and most easy to institute is the timing of our meals. So eat food slowly and chew slowly and don't sort of binge eat uh, because the larger uh, the meals causes uh, you know, increasing gastric distension and uh, uh, with a larger uh, stomach, and uh, more contents of gastric juices in the stomach, this also increases the propensity uh, for reflux. So take regular but, and smaller meals, more frequent if necessary, and avoid eating or drinking within three hours of uh, lying down uh, before your nap or your bedtime. Uh, obviously, when you lie down, uh, the loss of the effect of gravity allows the food to uh, reflux back up the esophagus much more easily. And uh, uh, it takes about two to three hours before your stomach can fully empty itself after a meal. <clears throat> Moving on to the sleeping habits. So uh, some simple things again that you can institute would be uh, elevation of the head of the bed by at least uh, six inches. So this is especially so if you experience a lot of nighttime symptoms when you sleep, uh, like heartburn or increasing uh, throat irritation when you sleep. And uh, this simple uh, effect harnesses the this simple uh, sort of uh, measure harnesses the effect of gravity uh, to help you uh, lessen the severity of reflux episode. Uh, and if you would like to sleep on your side, then choose the left side. The left side, as seen in the diagram here, uh, positions your stomach beneath uh, the opening of your food pipe or the lower esophageal sphinc uh, sphincter. So again, it harnesses the effect of gravity to uh, improve reflux. Uh, if you sleep on your back or in the right, on, or sleeping on your right side, then it tends to make reflux worse because uh, it increases the relaxation of the sphincter and also the opening of the food pipe is lower than the stomach. So it's easier for the food to reflux back. Moving to some uh, common things that we can use to treat this uh, condition. So um, the first uh, medication that we can use uh, is an acid or specifically uh, this a medicine called Gaviscon or Gaviscon Advance. So Gaviscon Advance uh, does not just simply contain uh, an N acid, that means an acid neutralizer, but it also contains sodium alginate, which is uh, a derivative uh, from seaweed. And uh, the, you know, the company that manufactures this says that it forms a raft or a physical barrier over the gastric contents. And because of this physical barrier, it prevents active reflux of um, the gastric contents back instead of just neutralizing uh, the acid. And actually this medication or Gaviscon has been the only medication shown to improve throat symptoms such as global sensation and throat discomfort. I'm sure many of us may be aware with uh, uh, gastric protective medicine. Uh, the, the technical term for this is proton pump inhibitors. And there are many, many brands in the market. Commonly, uh, Omiprazole is uh, you know, the first one invented and the most commonly used. But other uh, similar medication includes things like Nexium or Parriot. So this uh, medication is a, quite a strong medication which suppresses acid production completely. Uh, so uh, you know, it greatly improves gastric reflux symptoms because the acid is almost completely uh, suppressed when this medication is uh, taken. So things like heartburn, regurgitation, uh, uh, and bloatedness 
uh, uh, you know, respond very well to this medicine. Uh, it also improve, has been shown to improve sleep quality parameters, especially if you have reflux symptoms during sleep. But what it doesn't work for is throat symptoms. So if you have throat symptoms and you're only taking proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole, then it will not work uh, for, for, to, to make your symptoms better. But if you do have diagnosed uh, OSA, then a positive airway pressure device, as mentioned, is the first line of treatment. Uh, and uh, it's also been uh, so it is very, very effective in the treatment of OSA and snoring. Uh, and uh, together with this, it also reduces the frequency of uh, reflux and improves uh, reflux parameters when we do uh, you know, testing uh, of the pH, that means the acidity of the esophagus during sleep uh, when patients are on OSA. And last but not least, um, uh, specialist care. So in the event that you experience some of these symptoms, such as uh, bleeding, coughing up blood, uh, persistent symptoms, especially if uh, there's hoarseness, difficulty swallowing, like the sensation of something stuck there that doesn't go away. Uh, if there are new onset gastric symptoms in patients who are more than 40 years old uh, and uh, you know, uh, you know, other symptoms as listed here, then definitely seek uh, medical advice from your primary care physician who will evaluate you and uh, possibly refer you on for further uh, evaluation with the appropriate specialist. So some things we can do at a hospital, uh, as mentioned, we, we usually uh, routinely perform a nasal endoscopy, passing a small camera through the nose to take a look at the, the nose, the throat, uh, and uh, the voice box. Uh, and uh, if necessary, if you're also snoring, we will perform a sleep study for you. Uh, in, in certain uh, scenarios where gastric symptoms form the bulk of your symptoms, then a workup by a gastroenterologist or general surgeon will be more appropriate where they will uh, evaluate you with a uh, gastric scope. So esophageal gastroscopy, which looks all the way down to your stomach uh, to look for any ulcers or bacteria there that may be causing uh, increased uh, propensity for reflux. And in selected scenarios, we may also perform uh, a pH impedance study, which basically is a probe that's put in uh, to your stomach to look at the acidity of the stomach and how many times or how bad the reflux is. So uh, without, with that, I come to the end of my uh, presentation. I hope, I hope I've managed to leave with you the following take-home points, uh, just to know a bit more about reflux disease and its manifestations in the throat region. Uh, the relationship between reflux and OSA, as well as emphasizing the important first steps uh, we can take at home to manage this common but uh, bothersome uh, condition. Yeah, so uh, with that, thank you. And I think we have come to the end of our session and we will uh, yeah, start the Q&A session. That's right. Thank you very much, Dr. Leung, for the very uh, informative sharing on the relationship between reflux and its relation to OSA. So at this point in time, we've come to the last segment, which is the Q&A, and we would like to invite all our speakers to uh, turn on the camera and, of course, uh, address the questions that's been raised by all of you. Yeah, And we have Dr. Leong to be the moderator for this segment. Okay. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I mean, we have just shortlisted a few. Sorry, I mean, we've seen so many questions here, but uh, we, because of time, we cannot get to all of them. But we've just shortlisted a few uh, that uh, I think uh, are some of the more common questions. Uh, and we try to summarize all the questions together so that we can answer everybody's questions. So the first is uh, this question, how is it that I seem to have mucus flow each time after eating? And this is quite a common question. I think many of you have asked about um, uh, nasal symptoms um, after eating or with temperature changes, uh, like hot food, spicy foods and all that. So uh, can we have Dr. Peng answer this question? Sorry, yeah, which question? How, how is that I've seen of mucus flow each time after eating? All right, okay. So um, with um, eating, um, it depends on what kind of food you eat. So certain spicy foods and hot foods can actually actually activate certain systems in the body. This is actually what we call a gustatory rhinitis, which means a nasal inflammation after eating foods. And um, this can actually cause uh, the nasal mucosa or the nasal lining to be irritated. And it's actually a very common problem. 
uh, for patients who ask me what you know we actually do for this. Um, one option is actually to start on some nasal sprays because nasal sprays can actually reduce the sensitivity of the nose. Um, but if you're not keen for any medications, um, just avoiding the particular foods that can actually that you have noticed that cause this problem. So if it's spicy foods, maybe you can take foods that are less spicy. Or if it's actually foods that are very hot, you can actually cut down the temperature or rather eat foods that are not so hot. Okay, thank you. Um... Yeah, I think uh, there's a question on immunotherapy here, but I think actually uh, Dr. Peng has uh, already addressed this in his uh, talk. So, um, Dr. Peng, you want to just uh, answer this quickly or we move on? Uh, yeah, sure. Sorry, um, will immunotherapy be less effective for more growth art? Um, so, I, I mean, from what I, answer, well, what I interpret from the question, uh, I think the question is, uh, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but will immunotherapy be less effective as you're older? So uh, actually not really. Uh, immunotherapy is actually useful at all ages. Uh, you can even start uh, immunotherapy as young as two years old, but most, most of the time, um, most physicians are only comfortable to start at five years of age onwards. Uh, success rate is actually really good. Um, uh, if patients uh, can actually tolerate the immunotherapy, uh, that's over a 90% success rate. So uh, and I think that, that was what uh, I, I mentioned in my talk as well. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, okay, great. Thanks, Dr. Pong. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. What dietary changes uh, can help with sinus issues? Uh, did anybody uh, tag this question for live answer? I think a uh, shoe way I tagged it. Yeah, I did. Uh, oh, I, I think uh, usually sinus issues, it depends on what exactly it is. Um, if sinus, if you are re referring to allergic rhinitis, uh, then I think generally not really. Um, there's no real evidence as to uh, specific dietary changes that can be performed. La. I think some people are concerned that there can be things like food allergies that give rise, give rise to uh, no symptoms, but usually this is not the case. Usually the allergens have to enter through the nose to cause swelling and uh, the nasal symptoms. Uh, not too sure whether there's any benefit about cod liver oil, um, but generally for uh, smell issues, uh, there has been evidence for omega-3, which can help to uh, improve smell. Um, but other than that, uh, no specific dietary uh, recommendations that I can give. B, uh, Dr. Peng, do you have any other comments? Um, I'm not really familiar about the evidence of cod liver oil. Uh, to, as far as I know, I, I don't think that uh, it, it helps uh, significantly. Um, and in terms of dietary changes, um, I don't think there's anything in particular uh, that can help with so-called sinus issues. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier with uh, things like gustatory rhinitis, so uh, in patients that, uh, I think the previous patient asked, you know, well, how come on eating you can get, uh, you know, a runny nose or a mucus backflow? Yes, then that, that will make a change. So if you eat less spicy foods, then uh, if that's the trigger for you to get a runny or blocked nose, that can actually improve that. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's let's move on. Okay, did Sean? Uh, yeah, is it normal to wake up every two hours of sleep? I usually start sleeping around nine thirty to five thirty. Did you? Uh, would you like to address this? Yep. Uh, okay, I've, I've actually typed in the answer for this, but just oh. to to briefly talk about it. Well, I I think if you're waking up every two hours every night, uh, you know your your sleep is very disrupted. So you know when when you have this frequency of disruptions, you're going to wake up tired, uh, because your your proportion of sleep is going to skew towards a uh, lighter sleep, and you know it's not going to be as refreshing. So you know I I think there's there's some there's something that needs to be looked at over here. Um, you, I think the main issue is to find out what is causing this disruption not necessarily OSA. Sometimes it could be as simple as, you know, back pain that is making you wake up every time you turn or an uncomfortable bed or an uncomfortable sleeping environment. So I think uh, talk, to a, talk to a doctor, sleep doctor, and uh, explore some of the possible causes. If it's OSA, we can investigate and help you out, help you out with it. Uh, if it is an insomnia issue, if you have problems falling asleep or you wake up and you cannot go back to sleep, then sometimes a psychiatrist with uh, interest in sleep at our sleep center can help you out with that as well. So, yep, I, I, I encourage you to, 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 to talk to a doctor. Okay, great. Uh, can we next? Oh, uh, Sean, did you already address this in your type uh, question? Uh, no, no, I, I haven't. 
Yeah, so I, I think in general, you know, as with any new device, you know, uh, I guess what, what is the definition of elderly? You know, for the treatment of OSA, uh, when, we, when we think about surgery, we normally don't try not to operate on patients that are 65 and above. In fact, uh, in my own practice, generally above 60, I, I strongly encourage the patients to, to go on a conservative uh, approach with regards to their OSA management. Um, if you're talking about what is what does procedure involves, is in essence it involves uh, an implant. So the implant is put uh, in the chest, under the skin, and above the muscle. Uh, a, a wire is actually tunneled all the way to the, the neck, the upper neck, uh, where we find the nerve that controls the tongue. So this, this wire is actually clipped to that nerve. Uh, so that so we have to find out which nerve is the one that exactly causes the tongue to come forward so that we can stimulate the correct nerve. And then um, there's also a timing electrode that goes to your rib muscles so that, so that the stimulation of the tongue can be timed together with the breathing. So, you know, with regards to the, the actual surgery, it's, it's not supposed to be a very big surgery, um, but, the, but, you know, the, 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 point, the, the challenge will be to, to get the device in and to get, it, um, get, get the costs sorted out. So that is actually where we are right now. So um, hold on. I mean, just just keep well, keeping keep it on the back burner. Something that you can think about if you run out of options. And uh, you know, when when you when you when you run out of options and you're keen to explore this, just come over to SGH and we can talk about it and let you know when the device is in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this uh, irritating thin clear phlegm in the throat. Uh, that uh, you know has been bothering you for for eight years. I think I'll take this question. So, uh, as mentioned, uh, the sensation of something in the throat um, uh, uh, has many causes because the throat is at the junction of the nose, uh, the the opening of the of the food passage or the esophagus, as well as the opening of the trachea, which is leads to the lung. So, any lung related conditions can cause phlegm. Reflux, as I mentioned, can cause this sensation as well as nasal uh, conditions. So I assume that, uh, you know, uh, all these uh, other conditions have already been, uh, uh, you know, worked up and looked at by the lung uh, and the ENT uh, specialist. In the, those specific cases where everything has really been done, that means you've had, uh, uh, you know, chest evaluation by the lung specialist, a scope done and we can't find anything and you're still having some of these very um, irritating uh, symptoms, then you may have something called laryngeal hypersensitivity, uh, which uh, can manifest uh, with global sensation or even chronic cough that is unexplained. And in these situations, there are some more uh, uh, medications and even some procedures that we can uh, do. So medications such as neuromodulators like gabapentin, and procedures like um, nerve blocks of your of your throat, but these are really quite subspecialized uh, procedures, and uh, I, I think um, uh, if you know it's basically only available available uh, at the tertiary level at the SGH, we do have a uh, an upcoming chronic cough uh, service for this. So uh, do uh, speak to your um, uh, doctor and uh, see uh, whether they can uh, help you with that. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, Empty nose syndrome. Uh, I know uh, Shu Hui talked briefly about this, but uh, perhaps you'd just like to recap, uh, Shu Hui? Ah, yes. Uh, so again, it is an uncommon condition. Uh, and empty nose syndrome, as in as the term applies, it is the, a little bit uh, paradoxical sensation that you have blocked nose even when the nose is empty, the pet nasal passage is clear. Um, and really, really, we see this very rarely. Most patients benefit from uh, nasal surgery. La. Um, I think, what was the question about uh, Joe Hong? Uh, whether it's, uh, well, yeah, treatable or, or pre preventable. Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, as I said, it's not uh, common. So, uh, I mean, there, there are uh, various treatment modalities. So, usually, we will start off by diagnosing, uh, by putting in uh, some materials in the nose to see if that's really the cause. And if we do diagnose it, then treatment methods, usually we start off by uh, humidifying and moisturizing the nose by using uh, nasal saline irrigation. Uh, then if it is still very persistent, sometimes we can re restore the bulk that was lost during surgery by either injecting fillers or even putting in implants. Uh, but again, this is quite an uncommon condition. So... Um, we usually will hunt harder for other possible causes of blocked nose before we proceed with all these uh, management methods. 
Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's move on. I think we only have time for one or two more questions. I'm so sorry, everybody. Uh, yeah, next question. Ah, Gaviscon. Okay, so I think there are a few questions. I'll take this question and there are a few questions about Gaviscon and Omniprazole. Uh, so yes, the best time to take Gaviscon is after meals. So the suggested time is usually about a half an hour after meals uh, and, ju and just before bed. And so many of the studies that look at Gaviscon for throat symptoms specifically, uh, 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 you know, go on a four times a day regimen. That means after breakfast, lunch, dinner, and before bed. Uh, I will usually advise patients that, especially if the meal has been larger, that means maybe lunch and dinner, you tend to take a larger meal, then definitely you should take Gaviscon after that. And especially if you experience a lot of nighttime symptoms or symptoms when you wake up in the morning, then Gaviscon before bed, uh, immediately before bed would be uh, would be uh, helpful. And by extension, I think there were some uh, uh, questions also on Omniprazole. So, Omnipra so Gaviscon is over the counter, which means that you can buy it uh, you know, yourself from any pharmacy. Uh, but Omniprazole is prescription only. And there are some long-term, well, Omniprazole is actually very safe medication. There are some long-term uh, effects uh, with, uh, you know, uh, non-stop omeprazole use. Like there's been some links to um, atrophic gastritis, uh, diarrhea, uh, as well as osteoporosis even. So I generally uh, do not advise patients to, to go on omeprazole, you know, just indefinitely. Uh, on the other hand, Gaviscon is uh, safe to use because it is a simple uh, acid neutralizer uh, and uh, the sodium alginate component is uh, sort of organic, like it's made from seaweed. So only in very, very selected uh, uh, patients with maybe kidney problems that have difficulty with their uh, electrolyte uh, uh, imbalances, then, uh, you know, then long-term Gaviscon use may not be suitable. But um, uh, for the most part, uh, it is uh, very uh, safe. Yeah. So usually uh, with regards to how long and uh, you know, to take these medications, usually I'll start patients on both Gaviscon and Omeprazole if they have gastric symptoms. And I'll stop the Omeprazole after a few months and have the patients, uh, especially after, after the symptoms improve and have the patients just go on an as needed basis uh, for the Gaviscon. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, the, the questions. Um, yes, sir. So, Thank you very much, Lucas, for all the wonderful talks and informative sharing early to, uh, today. We appreciate your time very much. And of course, we'd like to invite Dr. Sean Lowe to give the closing address for the 200 minutes of Ear, Nose and Throat Health Talk. Okay. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for spending this uh, Saturday morning with us. I hope you guys uh, uh, found, found it useful and took something home uh, for yourself. So just remember, if you have any uh, issues, just feel free to reach out to us at SGH. Uh, you can consult us for anything ENT related. Uh, and we'll be ready to help you. So uh, without, I mean, I won't talk too much. I won't hold you back from your lunch. Uh, enjoy your Saturday and uh, goodbye, everyone.